All right, y'all, I'm Alan Hayden, the Lawn Care Nut. Thanks for coming back for yet another week. I've got something special for you today. So as you guys know, if you watched the last video I did, I gave you an update on the grass over at the Freedom Factory Racetrack here in Bradenton, Florida. And I told you that we were gonna be redoing the grass out there. So currently that work has already started. The rip out is almost completely done. Next step is gonna be to do grade and drainage, and then we're gonna put down the new sod. And when I talked about the new grass that we're putting down, I told you it's not zoysia, it's not Bermuda, and it's not St. Augustine grass. What it is, is it's actually all three. And so what I decided I would do is take a trip out to the sod farms and see our grass. It's gonna go in our racetrack. I was gonna see the grass in the field at the farm. And I was joined by Dr. Kevin Kenworthy, who is the PhD scientist and lead researcher who developed two of these grasses. The first one we're gonna look at is Citra Zoi. All right, doc, so here we are standing in a field of Citra Zoi. So tell me all about citrozoia. What's so great about it and where did you even find it? Citrozoia zoysia grass is a new zoysia grass cultivar on the market here in the state of Florida. And it's something that we developed in our breeding program at the University of Florida. The cross for citrozoia was made in 2008. At that time we had around a thousand seedlings. We narrowed those down over a few years, ended up with about 30 advanced selections and then trialed those in around 35 different trials, most of which were in Florida, but also in uh, several other states so that we could figure out which of those advanced 35 lines were the most adapted throughout Florida and in the other states. And one of those ended up being and released as Citrozoi zoysia grass. And so where do you actually find these seedlings when you're going to, to create this new variety or cultivar or whatever the term is, where do you find these at? So, I run a plant breeding program and plant breeders have collections of what we call germplasm of the species that we're working on. And germplasm means a collection of plant material. You want that plant material to have a diverse genetic background so that you're bringing together new combinations. And the unique thing about this zoysia grass plant is that it's a hybrid between two zoysia species. The two dominant zoysia species used in the turf industry are zoysia japonica, like empire zoysia grass that you're very familiar with, mm -hmm. or zoysia matrella, which is like Xeon zoysia grass, which is another zoysia grass in the Florida market. And they represent the kind of extremes in terms of wider leaf texture with empire, narrower leaf texture with Xeon. And this is a hybrid between those two okay. species and has an intermediate leaf texture. What I like about it is that you can have that really manicured look of the fine textured zoysia matrella like Xeon without the inputs. Okay, because I notice when we're stepping on this, I mean, this is a very dense turf. It's very tightly knit together. So what are some of the other attributes that you've discovered as you brought this to market now and you've done all your research and testing? What are some of the attributes that you've discovered that make it special? It does very well under a wide range of mowing heights. At UF IFAS, we try to recommend that zoysia grass be mowed at two inches or less. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always accomplishable by some homeowners or in certain situations and citrus always seems to have some good flexibility at a low mowing height here it's probably three quarters of an inch but in my own yard I'm at two and a quarter. Okay and that's more normal. I've had it that way for three or four years and it's been fine. Uh, citrus oil has a little bit better shade tolerance than Empire Okay. And one of the great things that we've noticed and gotten a lot of feedback from the producers on is that we're not seeing any large patch. Nice. The large okay. patch disease caused by Rhizoctonia is the number one problem on zoysia grass. I have it in mind every single winter and I got to live with it all winter because it can't grow out. Yeah, it looks pretty ugly. Yeah, so I'd have less, so I should have less fungicide inputs, things like that. What about irrigation watering? What, are the, what does that look like? It's not going to be much different than what you're used to with Empire. It's drought tolerance is a little bit different. Uh, Citrozoi kind of in the presence of drought or drying soils, citrozoia will delay wilting a little bit longer than some of the other zoysia grasses on the market. Okay. So it'll hold off a little bit, but when you do see it wilt, that's the signal that you need to water because the soil is really dry at that point. Gotcha. Okay, how about cold tolerance? Because, you know, Florida, depending, you know, you can be in South Florida and you really don't go dormant. North Florida, a whole different thing. It's like it's whole micro climate here. So how about that cold tolerance? What are we looking like there? That's a really good question, and it's another attribute of citrozoi, and it's been a focus of our breeding program to develop zoysia grass that holds color better in the winter. Mm -hmm. In Florida, particularly, say, Orlando North, yeah. when 
you know, and the winter comes along and your neighbor's St. Augustine is bright green and your zoysia grass goes dormant, mm -hmm. then you have lawn envy. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of our objectives has been to develop zoysia grass that holds color better in the winter. And Citra Zoya is one of those on the market that holds color better in the winter than Empire or some of the other zoysia grasses on the market. Good, so if it does go dormant, then it should come out of dormancy a little bit quicker than some of the others and things like that. Yes. The, the last question I have then, how about fertilization? Is this gonna be a heavy nitrogen eater here? Or are we less, or what are our thoughts there on pounds of nitrogen per year, that type of stuff? It's about the same as Empire. I wouldn't okay. expect any more or any less. The nice thing, because of that tolerance to large patch, you don't have to be as careful in the fall with right. nitrogen as you have to with other zoysia grasses. Okay. And that's really where that attribute comes into play with the growers because growers are always trying to push fields. You see the ribbons back here, mm -hmm. the grower wants to get those grown in so they can sell another crop. And growers have to be real careful in the fall with other zoysias. They can be a little more aggressive with citrus zoysia. So they can throw her down and hope for the best. Right, <laughs> but you know, as a university and an institution, we don't, we, we try to teach people and encourage people to hold off on nitrogen inputs because that's more sustainable. Mm -hmm and don't push color, particularly in zoysia grass. Follow the growth of the grass, and when you see that growth slow down, that's when you need to feed it a little bit, but don't push color in zoysia grass. Well, and I can see the color here is beautiful anyway, and so it's got a nice, naturally nice color to it, and so I could see how it really put, probably wouldn't need too many inputs, especially with this tight-knit growth, and I, y'all won't be able to see this on the camera, but I can feel it under my feet. It's just, it's tight. That's the term I use, tight. Tight, 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 yeah! and thick. So I can't wait. We're installing this out at the racetrack at the Freedom Factory and we are. We're going to mow it as low as possible. This You said this is at three quarter inch so we're going to try to keep it down in that range. We're going to use robot mowers and real mowers and just see what we can do with it. Awesome. All right now that zoysia grass that is going on the sides of the burnout pad. The next spot we're going to do are what I call the wings. These are the outer edges around turns one and two and three and four and what we're putting out there is called Citra Blue St. Augustine. And once again, I was joined by Dr. Kevin Kenworthy to talk about its attributes. Let's go take a look. All right, Dr. Kenworthy, so here we are now in Citra Blue St. Augustine grass, a completely different grass, but still just as beautiful. Tell us, how'd you find this one or how'd you create or propagate or whatever? I'm using the wrong terms, but how'd you come up with this one? Sure. So Citra Blue, uh, it's been around since 2006 as a seedling and same process we described with Citra Zoi, went through a series of evaluations to get down to a, a smaller number of lines. And actually RB Farms, where we're at today, contributed to the research phases of both of these grasses. Uh, actually, just right over here in the corner of the farm, we had big plots of the advanced lines of St. Augustine grasses. One of those was an experimental line that eventually was released and commercialized at Citra Blue. We released it from the university in late 2018. I think we formally named it in 2019 or 2020 and then started getting it out to producers. And here we are today now with about 900 acres of Citra Blue state, uh, statewide. A couple other states are in, that, in those acres, but most of it's in Florida. And the thing about it, I mean, I can't get away from the fact that it's got the word blue in the name. And so that comes from this dark blue green color. And uh, is that really the biggest selling point here? Is that naturally dark blue green color that we get? Well, obviously, you know, uh, that's an aesthetic component. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's really the least important component in terms of the breeding process, but there's a certain wow factor in a neighborhood compared to the other St. Augustine grasses. For me, this grass was really released because it has tremendous disease resistance, has exceptional shade tolerance, also has exceptional drought tolerance. So those are the things I'm looking for in the breeding program. And the fact that it has this pretty color is just some icing on the cake. Got it. Well, that's what I care most about is how it looks, of course. And so the other thing though, is there's a virus that goes around. I call it sugarcane mosaic virus, but what's the actual name for that? So there's a disease called lethal, vi lethal viral necrosis okay. and a sister disease called mosaic of okay. St. Augustine grass. Both of those are caused by sugarcane mosaic virus. That's what it is, okay. This virus has been in the state of Florida for decades and decades, only caused the disease mosaic, and it was of little, very little uh, economic importance. Uh, 
about meaning it didn't cause any didn't major cause damage really, so we didn't nobody paid attention integrated pest management says we just let it go just let it go okay uh getting close to 10 years ago this new disease that has since been named lethal viral necrosis began showing up and determined to only uh, it's only found in Floritam St. Augustine grass. Right. All of the other St. Augustine grasses are resistant to lethal viral necrosis. All St. Augustine grasses get the mosaic disease symptom. So mosaic will progress to the lethal viral necrosis in Floritam. Now, I want to underscore that Floritam is still the most important cultivar in the state. It is the base of the industry. And where you don't have LVN, Floritam is still a very good cultivar. Okay. And we don't claim that Citra Blue is resistant to LVN because it's so new on the market. Think of the decades of lawns that have been planted with Floritam to have that uh, experience and the decades with Palmetto and the right. other grasses. We only have a few years with Citra Blue. So far we haven't seen LVN occur on Citra Blue but we don't have that time period of experience for me to make a profound statement that it's resistant to LVN. Gotcha. My message is that so far it looks good. So far it looks good. So other than that, what are some other attributes? Let's talk about, uh, you mentioned uh, drought tolerance, I think. So what are we looking at there uh, as compared to say, I will also compare everything to Floritam because that's what everybody in Florida has pretty much. Right. So how does it compare there? So the data that we have, we can show that Citra Blue will perform very well with very limited amounts of water. We've, we've taken studies and imposed municipal watering restrictions on those experimentally. And okay, the first stage is twice a week watering. The second stage is once a week then once every two weeks and once a month and zero if you get in very significant dry conditions. Mm -hmm. And we've maintained Citra Blue really well at once a month, twice a month watering, definitely uh, once a week watering, whereas the Floritam almost always needed twice a week or once a week mm -hmm. at best. So there's considerable water savings potentially by switching to some of these newer grasses on the market, Citra Blue being one of those. And I'd love to see people actually putting that to the test. Seeing. Unfortunately, where you see these installations on neighborhoods, they're afraid to cut back on the water. Of course they are. <laughs> and they really should. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'd get the most benefit. This, the negative thing about Citra Blue, it's prone to thatch. And the more you water it, the worse that's gonna be. Okay. If we could get these developments to hold back, get it established, and then cut back on the irrigation, you wouldn't have the thatch issues develop. Does that also go back, because I read on the website that it's a slower grower. Um, is that kind of related there? It needs less water, it grows a little slower, so it doesn't need as much water to fuel that growth? Exactly, so you're exactly right. Physiology uh, based, you know, uh, the photosynthesis is gonna drive water use. And if this plant has an empirically slower rate of growth, then it's not gonna need as much water but also has a tremendous root system that goes deep into mm. the soil and is able to extract water from different depths that other grasses may not be able to. Okay, and so with that then with water, with mowing, are we mowing, because every St. Augustine I tell people, slam your mower all the way to the top, four inches or higher and forget about it. But we can go a little bit lower here, is that right? This grass actually performs better if you mow it shorter and you can get away with mowing it less frequently than you need to with Floritam. Okay. If you miss a mowing with Floritam, you may be baling hay the next week in your front yard, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. But uh, Citra Blue, because of its growth habit, you don't have to be as on top of that mowing. Uh, unless you're mowing it shorter, then you need to be, you need to keep that frequency up. Okay, well we like to mow, so that's the whole thing. I can mow if I need to, or I maybe not have to. Right. I can skip, that's the big thing. In Florida, you know, we get the rainy season, it's growing so fast, I need to go on vacation. I can't do that. When I get back, you say I'm bailing hay. With this, I got a little bit more forgiveness in okay. that regard. Where I really like to see this grass used is in shady situations. Okay. And it doesn't take much shade. It could be the, the, the trees in, on the neighbor's house across the road that cast shadows early in the morning or late in the day. Changes the growth habit a little bit of Citra Blue. Gets it a little more upright and you don't have that thatch issue. Okay. So a little bit of shade is great. Heavy shade, it does well with also. Okay, well that's where we really want to test it then because that's obviously in Florida the big thing is having a shade tolerant of any type of grass, but especially a St. Augustine. Sure. So. Awesome, thank you. You bet. All right, y'all, so those two are incredible and they're gonna look beautiful, but we've got one more for you. This one's going across the back stretch, 
and it's got a really cool story. Let's go out to the farm and take a look. All right, y'all, so this is our final grass selection for the Freedom Factory. This is North Bridge Bermuda. This is going on the backstretch. And I'm gonna just tell you, the coolest thing about this grass is this is the exact same Bermuda grass that is installed at Arrowhead Stadium, you Kansas City Chiefs fans. This is what they play on. We're a big advocate for sports being played on natural grass, and this is it. And that's one of the selling points of this Northbridge Bermuda is it's soft, and I can feel it under my feet. It feels thick and it feels dense, but it's also got a nice, soft texture. It's also known for its extreme cold tolerance. One of the things we know about Bermuda is as soon as we get any kind of cold temperatures, it goes dormant, but I'll put up a picture. You can see where this one can be grown. So this is also known for cold tolerance. And again, we're gonna put this on the back stretch. We're gonna mow it super low. We're gonna have a robot take care of it. We're gonna reel it before uh, any big events. We're gonna put a golf green in the middle. And uh, this is gonna be just the showpiece on the back stretch. So this is the last little piece for the Freedom Factory. We got the Citra Zoi, the Citra Blue, and now the Northbridge Bermuda. This is directly from Oklahoma State, and this is gonna be on the backstretch. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope you've learned a little something. Make sure you, you sign up for the uh, live stream for April 5th and 6th, and you'll be able to see this. Or if you're gonna be there in person, I'll be at the race myself, and we'll be checking out these beautiful new grasses. Now we got a lot to go. I'm making this video right now here uh, March 1st. <laughs> we basically have until April 4th April 5th to get this done. So things are gonna be really falling in place over the next couple, two, three weeks. But wait, there's more. All right, y'all, so there was our visit to the farm. And I just wanna say, the thing that stood out to me the most with this was the Citra Zoi. It was so tight. That's the word I kept using, just so knit tight. It just felt like that grass right there could choke out any weeds. And so I'm really looking forward to working with that one. Also looking forward to working with the North Bridge Bermuda because now that I know that that's where, that's Arrowhead Stadium, that's pretty cool. That's a, a high-class turf grass, uh, sports grass. So that's really neat. That's going to be fun to work with. But the Citra Blue St. Augustine, I wanted to say one thing. If you watch Cletus's video, which we shot that a few days ago, um, he let me go ahead and talk about the grasses in that video there uh, real quick, kind of impromptu. And I mentioned that Citra Blue St. Augustine grass is considered to be resistant to the sugarcane mosaic disease, or it's also called lethal viral necrosis. And I, I made that as a definitive thing, and that is not the case. You heard here Dr. Kenworthy said that it is, it's also, it's not definitive. What I did is I've read a bunch of articles on this and done a whole bunch of, of research. And what the article, I went back and read the articles now. And what they say is, is that there's been a couple of lawns or areas where there was lethal viral necrosis that killed Floratam, and they've planted the Citra Blue in that those lawns and after a couple years it hasn't displayed the disease problems or the disease symptoms that's what they're saying so they're saying it's promising but they need more time um and so what i when i read those articles is they've done that and it's promising i i also saw things in facebook groups that said oh well so and so is recommending um citra blue as an alternative i've seen that like in facebook groups and i melded that together in my mind and said oh that must mean it is considered to be resistant and it's not it just has a lot of hope they've just seen good things but they need more time so i just wanted to say that it is not considered to be resistant but it has hope that it could be palmetto st augustine grass is considered to be resistant they ha the university of florida will say that definitively i will link to to some articles below the ones that i read and that i over time misinterpreted in my head but i just want to say i was wrong about that and i don't want to offend anyone or tell anyone wrong um, it has promised to be a good uh, alternative, but the University of Florida is not coming out and saying that it is resistant as of this time. So just wanted to set that, that record straight. So I hope you guys enjoy the series that Cletus is doing on his channel that I'm doing on mine. I got a lot more coming. We got all the grasses ripped out. Today's Sunday when I'm recording this. So um, next week they're going to be doing the, uh, the leveling and the new grading. Uh, uh, it's not really leveling, it's grading. And then they're also going to uh, make some, some recommendations for drainage. And we're going to fix some irrigation. There's a lot going on. And then the sod will go in soon after that. So hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you learned a little something. And as always, I will see you in the water.